Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. You can also donate to the podcast. Just go to CanadaEHX.com and click Donate. Among Inuit in the last half of the 20th century, few have had as big of an impact on the day-to-day lives of the people more than a man by the name of Abraham Ukpik. An activist, he would spend his life working for the people of the North, giving them a voice and literally names. Ukpik was born on January 12, 1928, sometimes said to be 1929, in the Mackenzie Delta. At his birth, he was given the name Aktalak, after a shaman who had a special power to heal. As a young child, he would see the changing world around him as the fur trade started to end, and he would talk about seeing Hudson's Bay Company fur traders arriving and buying furs, but as time went on, they would appear less and less. He would eventually select the name Abraham Ukpik for himself, Abraham for the biblical reference, and Ukpik because it was the name used by his family for generations, which means willow. In speaking about names, Ukpik would say, The name never dies. It always lives from generation to generation. If the person you were named after was very respected, even old, old people respected the name. While he was brought up in the Anglican church, Ukpik was also raised traditionally and would hunt, trap, and travel by dog sled. Forced to attend All Saints Residential School in Aklavik at the age of 8 in 1937, he would learn English during his time at the school, and at the school he proved to be highly gifted and was able to skip grades 2, 4, and 5. His teachers told him he had a photographic memory, but it was still not easy for Ukpik, and he would say later in his life, It was not that easy, my friend, because I was 8 years old. I didn't know anything about yes and no. I didn't know the ABCs when I first went to class, although my sister tried to teach me to read Jack and Jill. I didn't know what language they were talking. They put us in a dormitory. One side of the building was the girl's side, and on our side was the boy's side. It was convent-like. You couldn't do anything. You were restricted. Upon his arrival at the school, he was given moccasins, boots, socks, and a number, 35 that was sewn onto his sweaters and painted on his boots. He would be taken out of school in 1941 so he could assist his father with trapping. With his father, he continued to learn traditional ways, and he would say, We learned how to follow the cycle of the seasons, and learn the times of the year when there were a lot of fish, whales, birds, and eggs. We followed the cycle, which nature called us to do. You had to move around to survive, and I think this was the one thing that we learned how to do. One year later, he suffered a leg injury that caused a permanent disability, but he continued to trap and hunt. Abe's father began to notice his son's ability to read and remember things. He would subscribe to two newspapers, Star Weekly and Life Magazine, and Abe would read to him about sports, war, and other news and current events. At the age of 16, he would contract tuberculosis and was sent to Edmonton to recover, the airfare being paid by Abe's father. Abe would relate, They had a staff of experts that all came from the war, x-ray technicians and surgeons. Some of the patients were cut right open, and part of their ribs were collapsed together. I had pneumothorax in my lung, and every week they put some air in it with water pressure. I could feel it for two days after. He would spend three entire years in hospital recovering, improving his English to the point that he was able to get a job as a translator with a distance early warning line. In 1957, He went to the hospital and was tested positive for tuberculosis again, spending 18 months in the hospital. In 1959, he began working for the Diefenbaker government as a translator and was able to learn the syllabic writing system used in the Eastern Arctic. He would translate books from English to Inektiktuk for the first time. Abe relates, There was a social worker who came to see me. He told me that they wanted somebody from Aklavik to attend the Eskimo Affairs Committee meeting in Ottawa. Someone in the office who had known me before mentioned that maybe I would be a good candidate to attend the meeting. By the 1960s, Ukpik was living in what was called Frobisher Bay, but is now called Aqualiet, the capital of Nunavik. 
Working at a rehabilitation center, he would eventually start working for the Department of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. In 1965, he was appointed to the Northern Territories Council, the precursor to the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly. This was significant as most of the council came from Ottawa, and his role was to represent the Inuit population in the Eastern Arctic, and he was the first Enoch to sit on the council. On February 4, 1966, he attended his first council meeting and began speaking in his native language before transitioning into fluent English. During his speech, he advocated for a higher standard of living in the North, and he also said he wanted to have a name like other Canadians. Ukpik would say later, When I made my presentation at the first meeting in November or October, I said, This is Canada, but how come the East doesn't have a member on this council? There must be a reason. Is it that colonial rule is not over yet? His time on council was short, and he was not reappointed to the council after his first year, with Simone Michael being elected. Michael would have a strong impact on the Inuit life as well, including through the surname project that he helped to initiate. The federal government had felt that Michael could serve the role of Ukpik on the council, and his seat was given to Chief John Tetlichi, the first status indigenous to serve on the council. Ukpik had already made an impact though, in July 1966, electoral boundary officials from the federal government came up north to divide the territory into three separate districts, who each had their own representative. His work was far from over in the north. Then this brings us to Project Surname. Beginning in the 1940s, the government of Canada used disc numbers to identify people in the north. The government had deemed this necessary to handle the distribution of family allowances due to the lack of surnames in Inuit communities. Traditionally, the Inuit were named after a relative to carry part of that person's spirit. Names could also change through one's life. For example, if a child was sick, that could be a sign that they were rejecting the name, and it was customary to change the name. It was also felt by the government that it took too long to identify Inuit names, so it was easier to use disc numbers. This would lead to the loss of traditional names in Inuit culture, and the Inuit were required to have the tags with them at all times and the code on the tag denoted where they were born. An E at the start meant that the person was born in the East, while a W stated they were born in the West. And while it may not seem like this was done in a prejudiced way, many did see the disc number tags as an erasing of culture. The process of using the numbers was supported and assisted by the churches and missionaries, who saw the traditional names of the Inuit as too similar to practices of paganism and shamanism. The church and missionaries encouraged the Inuit to take Christian names on their disc numbers. Many were told that this was a normal part of Christian and English naming systems. So while a person may have been born with the name of Lutak and would be known by different names in their family, they would be baptized as Annie or John, and under the system they would have the name Annie E7-183 or John E7-383, for example. It was only as the Inuit began studying in the South that they discovered that the numbers were not part of the typical naming process for surnames. Simone Michael would bring the issue of surnames to the attention of the public and the failings of the DISC system. This would prompt the government to launch Project Surname. Ukbik had also written an essay called What Inuit Want that stated Inuit wanted equal treatment like the rest of Canadians. Ukbik had the DISC number W3-554 and he was chosen to be head of this new project, which was a monumental task, but Ukpik was up to the challenge. From 1968 to 1971, Ukpik visited every community and hundreds of traditional campsites in the Northwest Territories, Nunavik, and Northern Quebec. In all, he visited 55 communities, going by snowmobile, boat, snowshoe, and plane. As he arrived in each community, he would record a person's name, explain the need to choose a last name, and how the naming process worked. The process followed a Euro-Canadian naming pattern, which assumed a male head of household. And as a result, the name selected by the man was then extended to the entire family. To complete the project, Ukpik had no budget and would often hitchhike on government charters to get to the communities. As well, while Ukpik was helping the Inuit choose surnames, the government only addressed him by his disc number. Even for paying him, they only used that number. Ukpik would say later, We asked people what name they wanted. Some people were very cooperative, but some would say, Why are you taking the number away? It worked for all of us all this time. When the project was finished, Ukpik would return to Frobisher Bay, where he lived with his wife and three children, and he began working as a teacher. 
he would focus on promoting the Inuit language and working with the Inuit Cultural Institute to create a new Inuit writing system that used 45 letters. And this system would be adopted in 1974. Also that year, Ukpik would again assist the government when Thomas Berger came to the north on behalf of the Government of Canada to head the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry. This inquiry's goal was to look at the social, environmental, and economic impact of gas pipeline running through the Yukon in the Mackenzie River Valley. It involved meeting with the Inuit population of the north and explaining the project to them. This often presented a challenge due to the huge scope of it. Ukpik would describe the trillions of cubic feet of gas as such. When you talk about trillions, imagine six sandhill cranes and six caribou, and try to count all the feathers and the hair on their bodies if you have time. You will never get near. A trillion is so huge. When telling people of places like Toronto, he compared it to the area of Aklavik down to Nelson Island, across the Mackenzie, and up to Inuvik. He would describe the subway system like harp seals diving underwater to surface further away. In the meetings, Ukpik described what he would often hear. I heard, we don't want industrial development before land claims. They were saying, this is our mother earth. It looked after us. The inquiry cost $5.3 million and comprised 40,000 pages of text and evidence. The recommendation was that no pipeline should be built through the Yukon and that a Mackenzie Valley pipeline should be delayed by a decade. Ukpik would travel with Berger through 35 northern communities to serve as both a broadcaster and an interpreter. The inquiry was notable because it gave a voice to the indigenous who would be impacted by having a pipeline through their traditional territories. The court says almost as much with pictures as it does with words. Both the text and the photographs show a respect for the north, its people, and its wildlife. The title, Northern Frontier, Northern Homeland, is a reminder. A reminder that what is a frontier to oil and gas companies is home for many others. And it is with that in mind that Berger makes his strongest recommendation. That is, that no gas pipeline be built across the northern Yukon. Berger says such a pipeline could be devastating, both socially and environmentally. That throws into question what had been considered until now the leading proposal for a northern gas pipeline, the proposal put forward by Arctic Gas Limited. It suggests a pipeline across northern Alaska and the Yukon, and then down the Mackenzie Valley. By knocking Arctic Gas, Berger gives a boost to the competing proposal put forward by Foothills Limited. It suggests one line along the Alaska Highway to carry Alaska gas and a separate line down the Mackenzie Valley to carry gas from Canada's north. On the Mackenzie Valley, Berger says he sees no environmental problem with a pipeline there. But he says such a line should not be built for at least 10 years. That decade is needed, says Berger, to settle native land claims and prepare for the coming of development. Berger warns the native way of life will be destroyed if a pipeline is built immediately. What he wants is not a sudden boom based only on pipeline construction, but a rational program for the economic development of the North, the modernization of hunting and fishing and trapping, efficient management of wildlife, and an orderly development of gas and oil resources over a period of several years. Berger also urges the search for oil and gas in the North be slowed down, at least until new methods are found to prevent and clean up oil spills. He says present techniques for fighting spills in the remote Arctic area are simply not good enough. For the further protection of the northern environment, Berger recommends the government establish its own body of experts, a group with enough knowledge to constantly assess the environmental impact of development in the Arctic. He also recommends the creation of a national wilderness park in the northern Yukon and of a sanctuary for white whales in the western Mackenzie Delta. There, the search for offshore gas and oil would be forbidden. As government reports go, this one is lively, interesting, and colorful. In its final page, Berger says the North cannot live in the past, but he says it will take time and careful planning to create a bright future there. John Blackstone, CBC News, Ottawa. For his work with Project Surname and the Berger Commission, Ukpik was presented with the Order of Canada on December 15, 1977. His citation reads, In recognition of the important contribution he has made to the preservation of the Inuit way of life by helping his people to rediscover their original surnames, through his membership on the Territorial Council and by his work with the Berger Commission as a broadcaster and an interpreter. Ukpik would spend the rest of his life living in the North and was a member of the Town Council for several years, while also serving on community and volunteer organizations. He would die on July 10, 1997 after a long illness. 
and his funeral would be held at St. Jude's Cathedral, which was attended by 500 people. Today, Abe Ukpik Hall is named for him. Ukpik spent his life promoting and protecting the Inuit culture. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Canadian History X, and if you did, please leave a rating and review. You can reach me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history. Just visit canadaehx.com. And again, you can support the podcast by going to Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. Just like all of these wonderful patrons have. Aaron O'Hara, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roa, Luke S., Vic Hedges, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, Spencer M., and Iris Gray. As well, if you'd like to get in touch, you can visit the Facebook page. Just search for Canadian History X on Facebook or go to facebook.com slash Canadian History X. You can find me on Twitter. Just search for Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram at Bairdo37. Information comes from the Canadian Encyclopedia, the Governor General of Canada, Wikipedia, Prezi.com, and traditionalknowledge.ca. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.